This was a worldwide phenomenon. If you're Derek Chauvin, what are you thinking right now? I'm hoping that people finally realize that we have a race problem. In America. I think we'll see a huge shift. I, I don't think this will just go away. You need to be able to dehumanize a person in a particular way for, for that to feel like it's okay to do. Why didn't any of the other cops that were standing around say anything? Well, he had his knee on George's neck. Handcuff him right there and go, this is too far. You're going to jail tonight. That's when you see the change. Then the thin blue line will get much thinner. The murder of George Floyd set off a firestorm of protests, riots, and social action in a pandemic environment where people were already afraid, angry, and uncertain. Derek Chauvin, the police officer responsible for George Floyd's death, was tried and found guilty on three counts. Because this case was historic on so many levels, we pulled together a panel of three phenomenal people to provide their reactions to the verdict. Walter Powell, a decorated 20-year police officer, Mimi Girgis, the founder and president of Papyrus Media Group and former host and executive producer of The Mimi Girgis Show, which aired on Sirius XM Radio and PBS for over 16 years, and Dr. Maricela Martinez Cola, an attorney who became a professor in the areas of race, racism, and social movements. She is the author of The Bricks Before Brown, which discusses the legal cases leading up to Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. Don't miss this incredible discussion where we get into police, legal, media, social, and historical perspectives on this landmark case. Welcome to the LifeWorks Podcast. Let's review some facts before we get into the questions. Derek Chauvin was found guilty on three counts. Second degree, unintentional murder. Third degree, murder. And second degree, manslaughter. Now, he was found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the legal standard. Within about a day or so, within about 10 or 11 hours, no questions asked, no continuances. So here's my question for the three of you. Given the overwhelming media coverage, the global outcry, the protests that ensued, and given the threat of confrontation, had he been acquitted? My first question for you is, was this verdict a foregone conclusion? And Walter, we'll start with you. I, honestly, I, I would say yes. The evidence was, you saw the evidence before you heard it. I, I, I think the trial probably confused it for people. But if you watch the video, it's just, it's very clear what happened. Now, now the question I would think, the only question that my mind came up in court was the legal part of it was who else is responsible? Was it his training? Is this the way he was taught? So yeah, no, no doubt. Anybody who saw the video before trial knew that this was uh, a bad thing. Yeah. How about you, Madi? Up until I heard it, wasn't, I wasn't convinced it was going to happen. I had way too many other names running through my head to make me feel otherwise. And myself and what's generally called Black Twitter out there, we're we're just saying, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. And there were a lot of people that were like, I refuse to watch it because they just didn't want to have, didn't want to be heartbroken. And so, yeah, I was pretty convinced he wasn't going to be found guilty. So, yeah, I don't necessarily think it was a foregone, because I think Rodney King was a foregone conclusion. They got it on video. Look at that. And there's so many other instances where the video came in and they're like, oh, it's obvious. Nothing happened to the police officers in place. So those names always kept running through my head. And I was like, I felt like Derek Chauvin was going to be another one. But I do think that there has been a shift since Rodney King, which was, I guess, 30 years ago or more. I think in this particular case, you had, you know, what's called the blue wall, right? As Walter said, there's the video There's the police saying that this is not our training. This is not how he should have reacted. And then you have the doctors when they tried a heart condition. He had, he used drugs. So that killed him. The doctors were all saying, no, what killed him was the knee that was on his neck for nine minutes. So I, I wasn't surprised at all. I think this was when I heard the trial and and the testimony in the trial, and this is a watershed and I'm, I'm glad. I think a lot of this needs to start happening. Yeah. 
So, Madi, I want to lead off with you on this one. Do you think it was possible to find a jury that didn't already know or formulate an opinion about this case before going in? I think in this time of the pandemic, it was probably really super hard because we're all in our homes or we're all stuck to the TV. I think that it turns out that the people that said that they didn't really know a lot about it weren't really sort of social media people, because that's where a lot of people get their information now is through their phones and, and they'll doom scroll through their through news feeds and, and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And there's new venues coming out all the time, podcasts, all of that. And if that's just not their thing and they're not huge television watchers, I think you could have gotten a few people that didn't know all of the details of it, or maybe may have heard of it. Surprisingly, I think they could have, but there've been lots of high profile cases that have happened over the time. Yeah. Walter, what do you think about that? Do you think it was possible for them to find a, a jury that didn't know about this? I, I think some people downplay how much they had already been seen and they wanted to be part of history. I, I agree that there's, yeah, I don't know what the number is because I'm a numbers guy. I, I think 90% of the world have these phones and the 10% don't. And I don't think they found that 10%. I think when the question was asked, are you convinced or your mind made up? Have you seen anything? No, I haven't because there's no lie detector. It's just, it's just your, you raise your right hand and you say, no, I'm not convinced. I'm, I would be fair and partial. I'm sure some of the people on the, on the jury were just that, wanted to be there. Yeah, and it's yeah. just my thought. Because you're right. Everybody saw that. Everybody knew. Yeah. Me, you, Mimi, what do you If you didn't see it. Yeah, no, I agree with that. This was a worldwide phenomenon. I, I follow the Arabic language media. And they were talking about George Floyd and mm -hmm. protests after and how African-Americans are treated by police. So, yeah. So that's you definitely clarify. I'm sorry. I'm not saying that all the jury, but I think that there may have been a few people they were able to get. But yeah, no, there's no way the entire jury could have been untouched. So Mimi, what if this wasn't caught on camera? Do you think the outcome would be different? A simple answer to that. Yes. Yeah. The only reason we've got to see change now is not because people are realizing we've really, police really treat African-Americans badly or Hispanics. No, it's because they're seeing it. You remember Eric Gardner, Trayvon Martin, th there's no video for that. So it's, he threatened the officer and he, it looked like he was going for a gun and in the heat of the moment, the officer had to react. And that's reasonable, well, that's a reasonable look. Police have an extremely hard job. It's very, it's life and death. I wouldn't want to do it. I honor that. I respect that. You hear about the first one and it's, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe he just overreacted. Second one, he, maybe that cop's a little racist. Third one, wait, what's going on here? Fourth one, okay, this is ridiculous. For me, it was just the overwhelming one after the other, unarmed. And it's, and I think finally this one, You've got a 10 minute video showing everything that happened, showing, you know, what Mr. Floyd was saying, showing what Derek Chauvin did, showing the others standing around. Walter, what does this mean for law enforcement officers going forward? It's certainly a, a shift, right? I think we'll see a huge shift. I, I don't think this will just go away. I think this will change. I think this will become a different people will become police officers. You're normal in your heart. I want to be a cop. That they're going to become a facilities or they're going to work, you know, for, for IBM or something. They're not going to want to do this job. It, it's going to take a special person who is, is committed to the direction it's going. And I think that'll be a good thing, honestly. I think that'll be a good thing. Mimi, how do you think the media handled coverage of this trial? Do you think it was fair? I, I do. We had this conversation about when you say media, what do you mean? I'll say big media. There's a lot of <laughs> There's a lot of people calling themselves media <laughs> that right, I wouldn't right. call media. And then you had the people on the fringes who would say, for instance, he was he was a drug addict. He was he was a bad guy, essentially. He was sure. a bad guy. Okay. Sure. Not but a then we want our cops being judge, jury, and executioner. He didn't deserve to die because he had some counterfeit money. That's we don't do that in this country. Yeah. And, and then some commentators, I wouldn't call them news, but commentators just going on the, the other extreme and just saying, oh, look, these people want to defund the police. They want to get rid of the police. They don't want the police anymore. They hate the police. And that's a straw man argument. That's, I don't think anybody except again on the fringes has said, 
completely take away all funding from the police. So Mari, what, what is um, Derek's legal recourse at this point? He definitely has a whole series of appeals. I don't know if if you remember at the end where the defense attorney was making some objections as to how the prosecutor characterized using words like story and basically calling them uh, liars. And they were trying to object to get it, you know, to preserve the record is what it's called. And and the judge said it himself. He goes, no, you've got, you've preserved the record enough to be able to get through an appeal. And so that's, he's, it's a very, the, the appellate process is a very long process. And what could theoretically happen is that it goes through all these appeals and people forget about it. And then another, you find some kind of some one sort of technicality that the prosecutor shouldn't have done. And then the mistrial has to you know, be done all over again. Is there a basis for Derek Chauvin's attorney to be able to cry foul and say, yeah, the evidence is there. The jury, it, it's their bias coming in. Do you think they, he, they might reach for that? Absolutely. They're definitely going to reach for that. I wouldn't be surprised if three arguments happened. One, that the video should have never been entered into evidence, that it should have just been stipulated that that they were you know, together, that that, they, that the death happened, or that they would only be able to show a few parts of it, right? But to have the entire video placed in there would have prejudiced the jury, particularly by the bystanders and everything else that was uh, going around. And the other thing is that the attorney, He, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he came back with a different attorney and said that his attorney was not competent and did not handle that case very well. And so that would probably be the, maybe the second one. And the third argument could be this should have required a change of venue. So those are the, if I were an attorney, which, you know, back in the day, those are probably the three things I would argue if I'm trying to get Derek Chauvin out of, out of prison. Yeah. Walter, if you're Derek Chauvin, what are you thinking right now? Oh, uh, wow. Who do I align myself with? Who's, who, who's on my side? Who in here? Good old boys. Who who are the nice ones that will take care of me and look out for me? Is I I, I got to get used to it. You know? I made this bed. Now I got to lie in it. Yeah, yeah. I I I hope he's not thinking what I don't want to say, but it <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me if he didn't stay in there long. So a question for for all of you: Did Derek Chauvin get a fair trial? Mimi, I'll start with you. I'm not a, a lawyer by any means, but I would say. I think he did. Yes, there was a a lot of media coverage. And when you're a defendant, you really don't want that. But there's a video. It's not like somebody had to make up a story about this. It's not his word against somebody else's word. This is, everybody got to sit down and watch. And there's no other way to interpret it. Nine minutes, and then he died by accident. What He said, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Yeah. And this isn't the first time we've had the chokehold and the whole, I can't breathe. And come on, was he not following what happened? Was it in Baltimore? So I, I don't know. I, I certainly hope he is feeling remorse. He is feeling repentant, but I don't know. Madi, did he get a fair trial, you think? Yes, definitely. I, I believe that one of the things that the law is going to have to start to reckon with is that jurors are going to come in a lot more informed on particular cases because everything is getting captured on video. And they're going to need to talk about that. But there are instances that even when it is caught on video, there it, there can be the my interpretation versus your interpretation. The one thing I will say about the defense attorney, because I listened um, to him, the way that he built it up, his argument was you can't pay attention to those 10 minutes, those nine minutes. You need to be able to look at all of the circumstances. And he literally from the ver- from the phone call that Chauvin got all the way until George Floyd left with the EMS, he basically dictated what it looked like from the officer's perspective. So that's another reason why I was actually nervous um, about it, because when you slow it down and break it down like that and break it down into all these really quick, fast decisions that you have to make, you can almost start to say, okay, maybe. That- I was just afraid that a jury was going to say, well, you know what, that kind of makes sense. It's that is hard to make a decision. You can't make a cogent decision. All of us are all standing around saying, you should have done this and you should have done that. And but we're not trained. We don't know what it is that they've been you know, um, taught. And so I think that's one of the reasons why I, I believe you had a fair trial, because you both get a shot at the apple. You both get an opportunity to be able to state your case. And whether or not it's a notorious or infamous or well-known incident, we've had enough of those in this country <laughs> to be able to say, yeah, this is becoming a new norm, I think. Walter, what do you think? Did he get a fair trial? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think he got too fair. Over it. I think he should have been tried 
just as quick as he the, the incident occurred. You know, it was, I mean, it, it, we gave him what, how many days? We gave him days to, to you know, prove that he was innocent. It's just, that was too, it, it, no, nah, that nah, wasn't fair. You know what I mean? <laughs> wasn't fair for the rest of the world. Wasn't about Floyd's family. Yeah. It should have been much swifter. Do you think that he had malicious intent? In that moment, what do you think he's thinking as he's holding him down and the other officers are watching? What's, what do you think is going on through his mind as he's doing that? I'm the boss. I don't think he's thinking, I'm going to kill you and get away with it. Mm -hmm. I don't think that was his thought. I really don't. I think he didn't think that he could do that. I don't think the thought came to his mind that let me keep a good eye on him so I can release my knee before he passes out. I don't think he thought that deeply. I think he thought, I'm, I'm going to win. You are beneath me. We have history. They know, they know each other. Mm -hmm. right? And you are not going to, in front of these people, show any of your unhuman strength against me. I'm on top and I'm on stand. Mm -hmm. And it's just, he got lost in the moment of, I'm bigger than you. And then I, th I think it set in at one point he realized, I guess I got to get up here sometime. It's too, yeah. it's too late. So what do you think was the key deciding issue in this case? I, I think it was the fact that we had a video and the doctor saying he died because of that knee. George Floyd was a big man, but he did not present a physical danger to all those cops. Yeah, you subdue him, but it doesn't take nine minutes to subdue somebody. Like he's down, he's on the ground, that's it. Right. If you wanna cuff him or whatever, that's it. Yeah. yeah, and I think this case really does, I'm hoping it's a watershed, I'm hoping that things change. And I'm hoping that people finally realize that we have a race problem in America. There's a lot of people that are not African-American, that are not brown or other immigrants that just refuse to believe it. No, we're fine. We, we treat everybody nicely. Some of my best friends are black. That's what people are thinking. Oh no, we're nice to everybody. And that poor police officer, oh, he's just so stressed out. And he shouldn't, that guy shouldn't have, he's scary. He shouldn't have scared him. But I think now I hope that it's starting to dawn on people. We have a problem with race and all of us have a role to play in addressing that. It's not enough to say I'm nice to everybody. So I don't have a problem. No, we all have a problem when this kind of thing is happening. Madi, just to dovetail on what Mimi's saying, what are you hoping that people will take away from all of this? I'm hoping that, well, I do, one of the things I do believe is happening, there is this tremendous change happening uh, as far as what people uh, are thinking about race. So I teach uh, about race and racism and the civil rights movements and all of that. And I usually, everywhere that I've taught, and you know, I've taught in Atlanta, I've taught here, and here in Utah in particular, I used to have to spend about the first three to four weeks convincing my students that racism was real, that it wasn't something that was just in in our collective heads and that there's some kind of thing where we're all saying, okay, you all think that's racism too. Okay, we'll all tell them that that's what it is. This was the first time I came in and they were like, no, yeah, we believe it. Okay, let's go on. And so I was able to get into some, I was able to have much deeper conversations with my students and they were able to understand the systemic problems of it. Not just that it's a, that's not just a Derek Chauvin thing. It's not just an individual, but this is something that there's a lot of things that have gone into creating a Derek show in order for that to happen. And so I think that's one of the things that I'm hoping a lot of people take away. A lot of people are saying that this isn't necessarily justice, but it is accountability. And I think that one of the things that for me, because you were talking about what sort of changed, what was the big change? And we did have the video. That's absolutely true. Um, and the video can be interpreted either way. There, there are some people that just said he was on drugs and listed all the other bystanders were telling him to do and so there's still people that even argue, even over the tape and the video of what, what kind of happens. One of the things that was a big turnaround for me, honestly, was when the chief of police testified. Amen. That one, I, I was shocked. And I was just, I was listening to it. We were in the RV and I was listening to his testimony and it was compelling. 
And the prosecutor, the, the prosecutors in this case were just brilliant. It was like the prosecutors were a pro football team and the defense was a little league football team or whatever you call the little league. They, he was, the, it was outmatched, very clearly outmatched. But for the chief of police to come and say, this is not who we are. This is not who we are supposed to be. And says, you can have 99 wonderful interactions. I'm never going to forget that line. You can have 99 wonderful interactions with people. But if you get that one bad one, you know what I mean? That's the one that they're going to remember. So you need to, uh, you know, be aware that could happen. And we just, it's the idea that what I've heard a lot of other people say is that there's nothing that a good cop likes better than seeing a bad cop go away. That this was, this was a trial about good policing and what is good policing supposed to be and that this is not an example of good policing and that good police officers should say, yeah, we, we need to be caught on that. But yeah, the blue wall of silence, as they call it, came crashing down. And I, I wonder if, if it would have been closer, if there would have been more to convince. I'm not too sure, but I thought that was pretty compelling when that happened. Walter, how about you? What are you hoping that people will take away from this? That change is here, not just having the video. When the police officers, when the chief stood up and said, this is not us, we got to go. We got to go further than that. He said this was not us when, when, after he saw the heat. Say it right there at the scene. While he had his knee on George's neck, handcuff him right there and go, this is too far. You're going to jail tonight. That's when you see the change. And that's what we're going to see. That's next. Right now we're seeing, hey, but do you have tape? But do you have video? That's going to be the thing, right? So tapes will disappear. Video will disappear. The laws will make the video go away, right? We're going to go back. They're going to go, somebody's going to say, it's, it's, it's illegal to tape somebody. It's, you can't do that. You can't record his voice. You can't tape him. That's going to go away. But when you have the officers on the scene who are going to be empowered to say, if you violate somebody's rights tonight, I will, I and the team will take you to jail. Then you'll see real change. Then the thin blue line will get much thinner and it'll be people. We all work together. Wow. That's the real change. That's my takeaway. This is just the beginning. Mimi, how significant is this trial, historically speaking? How do you think it will be recorded in history? We don't know yet because we're still in it. Uh, we still have to wait for sentencing. That's about two months away. So we'll see, we'll see. But the fact that we've got a conviction is significant. And I think, I'm hoping that, as Walter said, that, this, that, that the police will police themselves so that they will start doing a training on their implicit biases. They don't realize it. They see a black guy and they're like, oh, he could kill me. They see a white guy. Oh, he, sir, can I see your license and registration? Mari, from your perspective, because you study the history of this, how significant is this historically? Definitely when you look at it, sort of legal history, it's a really big move. And then when you look at uh, social movements, this one, this particular social movement and, and everything that comes with it is a very different one. I'm wondering sometimes if we'd have been in the pandemic, would it have been different? Would somebody have said, oh, I don't have time to watch an eight minute video and then run off into their day? Because I really think that what's been critical here is time. And I shared with that the last time we spoke that time allowed people, not just the time on the video, but the pandemic allowed people time to digest what was happening. Time to sit there and actually look at the whole thing and hear him cry out for his mother. And I think at this point, there's like, a, we've all got it collectively memorized in a way. And so I, don't, I, want, I often wonder if we were not in the pandemic and we're still in our everyday busy lives and worlds where we didn't necessarily have to think about these things all the time, would it, how would it have been? So it's historic in that it happened during a time where people were allowed to really think wow, I think we do have a race problem here. In the meantime, you have black and brown, Asian and, and indigenous communities saying, yeah, <laughs> we've been trying to tell you that for hundreds of years now. And now you believe us? And the fact that it was George Floyd in particular, that's who everybody was rallying around, was a real, for me, as a person that does comparative historical history, was such a surprise because he wasn't, I, one of the things I always felt like the Black Lives Matter movement had from its inception with Trayvon and, and Michael Brown was uh, they didn't have a sympathetic symbol. They didn't have somebody that, that became human to them, that had a life that I thought it was gonna be Tamir Rice, but he was just at that age where he's not cute anymore. And then I think his mother was a bit problematic with how she's presented to the media and all that. And so I think it was just really fascinating that it was, I didn't expect it to be a George Floyd, somebody that is not very well known, that did have, did have its struggle with drugs and had previous interactions with the police officer and all of that. And so I, I think it's really, honestly, it's time. People got 
time to sit and instead of navel gaze or look at the next thing that they had to do, were able to sit with this with what's going on here. And because computers are all fit with algorithms, now all the things people are going to see in their feeds are all these shootings that happen. And then it becomes like, okay, this is ridiculous. And that was happening before too, though. There was stuff that was coming before. So I think this is a historic moment in that it turned something in the sort of collective minds of white America. So I think that is probably what makes it really historic. And so I wonder, once this pandemic is over and we all go back to normal, what's it going to be like? Because we have people that are saying, all these corporations are donating X, Y, Z as much as you can now, because you know they're going to forget. And they're going to go back to the way that it was before. But we'll see. I, I agree with Mimi. I had a colleague tell me it's hard to process trauma when you're in it. And I think that this last year has been very traumatic for a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And once we get to the other side of it, I think that's when we'll be able to say, okay, what's the next step? We're going to have to see if this stops, if this at least decreases the number of, of deaths. And there's. I was just watching a video of a, a young man pulled over by Virginia state police and he videotaped everything and he was cursed at and violently taken out of his car luckily he didn't die but it's that kind of thing anybody else would have been saying sir your registration is expired i'm gonna have to give you a ticket i I need to see your driver's license i need to not pulling him out of the car so the fact that he has to videotape i have never had to videotape a police officer pulling me over am you're speaking do you know how fast you were going okay sorry Here's my, I never feel like, oh, I need to show my hands. I need to, I need to tell somebody I've been pulled over in case something happens to me. They have uh, apps and everything that are out now that you can signal to your friends when they, I mean, so it's def- t- definitely changed technology. There's now cameras you can put in your car so that even if they do take your phone away from you, there's still something recording the interaction. And uh, people have to say, wow, is this what we've come to? Is this the, the country that we've become that people have to feel the need? And then you can say, oh, he got pulled out, he got cursed, but luckily he didn't die. You know what I mean? And, and that it's this idea that's the, the normal or the natural next step that people, everybody assume is going to happen. The other day, I actually saw a video of a woman, she was being arrested. I think she was, she was drunk or, or whatever. And there were three police officers and they were trying to hoist her up. And I guess she kicked one of the police officers and in that process fell. And the police officer came and just started punching her in the face. You know, violently punching her in the face. But this is what made it different. His fellow police officer said no, and they pulled the police officer off of her, pushed him to the side and said, cool down, and then went back and checked, are you okay? So when it treated her like a human, I treated her like a person and not sort of not back in, in the times of enslaved days, people were treated as property. If they weren't people, they were property. And in today's day, they aren't people, they're images, they're you know, threats. There's something that's not necessarily human. And so I think that in order to have this, you need to be able to dehumanize a person in a particular way for, for that to feel like it's okay to do. Walter, what do you think is the historical significance of this? Oh, I agree. I totally agree with uh, both. It's, yeah. We're in it, right? I mean, right. We're, we're in it. And so much has been said in my mind. It's just running out. Uh, we're in it, but this thing can change. Like it's this, by the time the synthesis can come around, if we're not still in it, it could be forgotten about almost, but I don't think it will. This is going to go a long time. Yeah. This is a very long time. And I, and I want to share, I want to share a story about just our training. When I was in the academy, we would train on just the track and you would just, you would react the way you were trained to the person's actions in the car, to their actions never to what they looked like or who they were. And, and perhaps we thought we were doing the right thing by, it doesn't matter who's behind the seat. Treat everybody the, the same. We all been taught that. Treat everybody the same. Can't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. Gotta treat us different. We are different. Yeah. Because yeah. our experiences are different, right? Our history is different. You can't treat us the same. So, right. right. What are other police saying about this case? Wow. It's pretty much everybody is in agreement. It was, it was way too much. Nobody's been taught that. When I talk even with Jive, talking with my buddies, I don't remember being taught the knee move, but we all know, no, we all, nobody is saying, hey, God, I've done that before. Everybody I've talked to is in agreement. That was crazy that he did that. Why would he do that? But so then, Walter, it's, why didn't any of the other cops that were standing around say anything? Let me tell you something. That's hard. 
it's really hard to do. It's really, you have to do it. You have to do it. And if you can't do it on the scene, you got to do it the minute the scene ends. You got to go in the locker room. You got to, because that line, that thin blue line, it's there. You got to say, hey, guys, I'm not part of that. I'm not, do not, you're not taking me down. I have a family. You got to do it. And, and, and it takes a big guy. Right? I don't mean a big guy like George. It takes a, a strong man to, to on the scene say, Ho, 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 guys, time out. This is too much. Let me take over. Hit the locker room. Hit the shower. Let me take over this. Let me help. Let me do this. And it's, it's hard for men to do that, but it's got to be done. And it will. And it will be done. It's uh, interesting because they were also new officers, right? Weren't the other two gentlemen, they were new officers. And, and when I was listening to the defense and they slowed everything down, they each were asking, they were looking to Chauvin for leadership. Is this what we right. do next? Right. Shouldn't we put him over to his side? And he's like, no, shouldn't we do? There was like a, oh gosh, what do they call it? Where they put the, the feet in the together, you know? Right. That. Which I think is probably one of the reasons why I forget it. That is a terrible thing to call it. You know what I mean? That's even dehumanizing Absolutely. people even more. When you say that, you're, you're tying up a hog. Absolutely. Basically what, um, and so they were really taking their cues from him. And I think that's mm-hmm. what happens a lot is that yeah. the veterans, there's a training that happens. So that's what makes this remarkable. And I don't know if this is, I wanted to ask you, Walter, actually, not to take it away from you or anything. This is a profession where you go to an academy, and I had never heard this part of it before. For, I guess, some academies can be like nine weeks or it's weeks, sure, sure. basically. Uh-huh. Whereas every, most every other profession requires at least a bachelor's, right? You know, mm-hmm. the, or even two years of training in a university. And so you, you give these young people whatever weak amount of training and then just throw them out into the field. And so a lot of it, I feel like, is on-the-job training, very similar to how teachers mm-hmm. work. And these are the two professions you're not really allowed to touch. But now people are getting more critical. You're not allowed to talk about teachers and you're not allowed to talk mm-hmm. about police officers because they're both doing something you can't possibly imagine doing. But now that's really starting to change. And I was wondering if if the, does it require more training? Should we look at a two-year degree for people to receive so that they have the time to look at things like implicit bias, to be able to read about the history of policing so that they can be more knowledgeable about that before they go out there? Because every other profession has some kind of check and balance built into the system, right? You have a bad lawyer, you get their uh, law degree revoked. You get a bad doctor, you get their medical degree revoked and teachers and, and police officers are the two that it's really hard to get rid of them and the veterans train the young people so no, I, I, I agree I, I like the degree the two-year degree I'm sure at some point they'll consider it there are some departments that require it now but what I would like to see is the degree come after the employment because if you you put the stipulation that you have to have a degree if you look at those departments they're they're five percent are minorities right? We won't, the minorities won't get a chance to, to do the job when they can do the job. So I, I, I do like it. I would love to see uh, a degree in psychology that you gain, that you get once you join the department, and then you go to school. That, that would be very nice. And training also for mental illness, how to deal with it. I, I really would like to see uh, the police trained in that, and that if we know that there's a case of mental illness, to send people that are really trained and know how to deal with that, know how to de-escalate, because it's, that's also another tragedy of sending police who don't understand what's going on. It's a guy brandishing a, a, a knife, so let's just shoot him. And also, that's one of the things that the misnomers about defund the police, people thought it was like, yeah, don't give the police any money. But defund the police was actually requesting and asking that. We need right. more people trained to help the police because you can't expect police officers to be mental health counselors and family therapists and recognized when somebody needs drug rehab. And so I think that it was a really, I think, interesting thing to call it, the phrase defund the police, because it did. It just sounded not the way that it was supposed to be. But I agree, the mental health training and, and that just to be able to say that you can't expect this one person who's gotten this limited amount of training to be able to go out there and do all those things. I recognize that. Yeah, I guess defunding the police is a catchier slogan <laughs> rather than uh, reallocate funding to, it's just, it wouldn't fit on a t-shirt. So we can you know, <laughs> It's got three syllables to it, you know, <laughs> and you're marching. This has been just an incredible discussion and, and I'm grateful to, to all of you. I have one last question for all of you. Let's, you know, turn the clock ahead 10 years from now. 
what significant change are you hoping to see as a result of this moment in history? Mimi, we'll start with you. I hope that we're not hearing about this anymore. I hope that people aren't being pulled over or stopped by police and dying. I hope that people will talk about this moment as the end, the beginning of the end. And I hope that people will talk about, again, the police being our defenders, our protectors, our allies. I would hope that African Americans don't have to sit down with their children and say, honey, if you ever see a police officer, make sure you show your hands, don't make any sudden movements. I hope that they don't have to have those conversations anymore in 10 years. Yeah. Mari, how about you? I, so again, it's, we're still processing this when, when I'll be very candid, when the, I sat down to listen to the verdict again, fully expecting it to be either not guilty on the smallest charge or just not guilty all the way through. And when I started to hear the guilty, I act, I started crying and, and I purposely didn't want my son to watch just in case it wasn't going to be a good um, verdict. And so then my husband goes upstairs and he says, yeah, Derek Chauvin was found guilty. And all I heard was, yes. And he came downstairs and he's walking around. He goes, mom, isn't that great? Isn't this awesome? And I, I was sitting there thinking, he, he, has, he now, he's grown up in a different world than I have. Rodney King happened three years ago. This is his Rodney King, but with, a, with the right outcome that was supposed to happen because it just seems so obvious. And so I, I think a lot about for my son, and I hope that this is a world that will continue to want to learn more about racism in this country and the systemic change that needs to happen. And we'll start thinking more deeply that we don't lose this ability to think deeply about things. I, I tell people there's a lot of woke Wilmas walking around right now. You know, they're all super woke. You know, like, ah, I learned this and I did that. I've read Abraham Kendi's book. And so now I know this and, and so, you know, so on and so forth. And one of the things that a colleague of mine said is when, when people are woke, you have to remember at one point they were asleep. And so I'm hoping that people don't go back to sleep and feel like it's this is not on our radar anymore. So I want my son to continue to grow up in a world where he really does see some form of justice happen. And he's not sitting there thinking, we collectively as people of color are never going to win this, this fight. Walter, how about you? 10 years from now, what are you Ten hoping? 10 years is not a long time. 10 years is not a long time. We won't see much change. We won't see. We're going to need a little more than that. A little more than that. Second <laughs> generation, at least. So Rodney King was 30 years ago. We're going to need a little more than 10. We'll be right here. I yeah. hate to say it. We'll be right here. There'll, be, there'll just be more cases, more, more trials, more videos. There'll be more witnesses, but we'll be right here. I think we'll but eventually, it. our youth will change the world, right? Our youth will change the world. My son now, when he was a kid, we were watching boxing match, and there's a white guy and a black guy fighting. And I'm, I'm absolutely checking in on to see where I, how well I'm doing with raising this boy. So I said, hey, what's well, on? Which one do you want to win? He says, the one in the red shorts. And I thought, yes, he didn't see that was a white guy and a black guy. He saw white shorts and red shorts. And I thought, yes, that's the future. That's the future. It's going to take a lot more than 10 years. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for that. Thank you all so much for engaging in, in this discussion. Wow. Uh, just powerful perspectives from all of you, from law enforcement, from media, from legal and, and educational. This has just been beyond expectations. So thank you for your time, for your perspectives and wisdom. And, and I'm grateful to your families for loaning you to me for, for about an hour on a Friday night. So thank you all so much. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, click the subscribe button to get the latest content and check out these other great clips from the podcast.